These two lectures, first one on Henry David Thoreau and the second one on Fyodor Dostoevsky, will focus on perspectives on freedom, that is, the way in which freedom may be perceived from two very contrasting points of view. We've already discussed freedom, as you'll remember, in the context of John Locke's philosophy. Uh, now we'll move to Thoreau and then Dostoevsky, contrasting at the end all three of them. Locke, Thoreau, and Dostoevsky. Thus far in our lectures on the great thinkers, we've dealt exclusively with what we in the profession call dwems, that is, uh, dead white European males. Uh, now we're moving to a dwam, a dead white American male, and uh, hopefully, because he's an American, he may be more accessible to us. I think at least in terms of getting to his birthplace, for example, he's much more accessible. Uh, it's not so easy to get to Hobbes or Locke's small towns in England, but it's quite feasible to get up to Concord. And uh, so I advise you, as I advise my classes of students when I begin to talk about Thoreau, to take a trip on your next vacation. If you haven't already done so, uh, go up to Concord. Concord, that magnificent place, the occasion of the American Renaissance, as we like to call it, as F.O. Matheson called it in his great book on those figures that emerged inexplicably, unpredictably during that time in the middle of the 19th century, all gathered together at Concord, Hawthorne, Thoreau, and Emerson, and Alcott, wondrous that is, perhaps never before or since in America did we have so much culture concentrated in so small a place for, regrettably, so short a time. But nevertheless, Thoreau was born there in Concord, and so when you take your trip up, uh, I encourage you to visit his place at Walden Pond, the place where he spent over two years on a kind of pilgrimage, but at the same time, an isolated spiritual retreat. In India, we call them ashrams. In Concord, it was Thoreau's cabin on the edge of Walden Pond. When you go up, I urge you, take the plane to Boston and then the subway out to North Station and get on the train to Concord. It takes about 45 minutes. And when you get off at Concord, walk back towards Boston along the railway tracks for about 27 minutes. The very uh, same line, the very same path that Thoreau took in 1845 when he built his place in Walden Pond. As you walk along, you'll see the pond on your left and uh, move towards the pond, walk around it, around the edge, and you'll come shortly to the hut that Thoreau built there the place where he stayed, where he moved in on July 4th, 1845. Near the place of the hut, of course the hut is not there, but the site of it is, near that place you'll see a, a large pile of stones that was begun about 10 years after his death in 1872 by one of his friends. It's a memorial to Thoreau. And those of us who admire Thoreau take a stone and add it to that pile, which is extraordinarily high. On occasions where I've been up there and walked around the pond and talked to people who were throwing stones on that pile, and I'm sure several of you have done this yourselves, uh, to made that, made that pilgrimage that my spouse and I try to make every year if we can on our wedding anniversary. Thoreau means that much to us. When we do that and add a stone to the piles, and as we'll talk to other individuals and they'll, all over the world, they will have come from Asia and from Africa and all parts of Europe and the United States at times. I haven't met them from all those parts of the world, but I infer that from the dozens of people that I have talked with when I've gone up and walked around Concord and the pond 
What is it about Thoreau that fascinates people so much? What is it that explains this appeal? Why is it that in the years that I taught, for example, at Indian universities in Delhi and Calcutta and Madras, that students there were more interested in Thoreau than any other American writer? Why, what was it about his thought that has a universal connotation that draws people to him? Why should they be more fascinated with Thoreau's version of transcendentalism than with Emerson's, or more interested in Thoreau's naturalism than in Hawthorne's fiction? More often, individuals ask me in the small towns in India, have you read Thoreau? I think the attraction, the appeal is because of his journey. That is the personal journey that he took, the way in which he devoted his life to a kind of cause. And that cause is, as we'll see, spelled out in Walden, or you've perhaps seen, because I assume that most of you here have read Walden at one time or another. He spells it out in Walden, and there and elsewhere, he makes it clear to us that he was influenced, as very few Americans have been, not only by European and American thinkers and writers, but by Indian and Chinese thinkers and writers. There's an excellent essay on this from my colleague at Barnard College, Barbara Miller, who writes in an afterward to her recent translation of the Bhagavad Gita, why did Thoreau take the Bhagavad Gita to Walden Pond? Now, how many Americans, writers, philosophers, may we say that they had with them as they journeyed through life a copy of the Bhagavad Gita, especially in 1845 when it wasn't particularly fashionable as it was in the 1960s to have a copy of the Bhagavad Gita in one's hands. Thoreau had it with him, and he understood European wisdom, and he often said that two people that influenced his quest, his journey, were Socrates and the Buddha. And I think that if we take those two individuals and look at them in terms of their lives, much can be said about how Thoreau's personal journey is explained in terms of Socrates and the Buddha. There was a story that Thoreau liked from the Socratic Dialogues, from Plato's great work, The Gorgias. It's a story that I've told before in this series, that is in the lecture that I gave on Plato here 18 months ago, but I want to retell it again briefly because it captures from Thoreau's point of view so much of what he was about. The story begins in Athens, about 411 BC when Socrates is in the marketplace, the Agra, and uh, he's discussing, as he repeatedly discussed, the great ideas of great wisdom, that is, beauty, truth, justice, goodness. What is right? What is good? And as he was discussing this uh, among his friends, Plato among them, of course, his young disciple and pupil, Plato, uh, off in the distance, Plato and the group sees a, a figure who was not particularly sympathetic to uh, Socrates, one of those who was responsible ultimately for Socrates taking the hemlock, Callicles, a, uh, a sophist, in part a creation of Plato, because Plato was always putting down the sophists, but in large part too, an individual that represents all that Socrates despised about Athens and to some extent all that Thoreau despised about Concord. And that is a life given not to a quest for goodness and justice, but rather to the drachma or to the dollar. And uh, from Socrates' point of view, when he sees Callicles coming in the distance, he says, his instinct is, well, let's bring Socrates, uh, let's bring Callicles into this discussion. And Plato says, Socrates, you know that that's impossible. Callicles never wants to join us in any discussions of this kind. I mean, you're talking about transcendent ideals, and the sophists don't believe in that. They're relativists. You know the whole story. And Socrates says, yeah, but let's try. Let's, let's make another attempt. And Callicles comes closer, and Socrates, in the midst of this discussion, puts his hand on Callicles' shoulder and says, Callicles, please join us in this discussion. And uh, Callicles looks at Socrates and says, Will you leave me alone? This nonsense that you're constantly dishing out. Look, you're spoiling our youth. Remember, Socrates was ultimately convicted of corrupting the youth, youth in Athens. The worst possible charge was scandalous and infamous charge that any democracy is brought against a prophet. But as Socrates 
So he doesn't join us in Calicles saying, forget it. And Socrates tightens his grip just for a moment and says, Calicles, we're engaged here in a discussion of some importance, and that is, what course of life is best? With that line, with that sentence, I think political philosophy is born. That is the goal. The goal in life is to determine what course of life is best. And Plato sets this goal throughout his works. This is the question, not only in the Gorgias, but in the Republic and the Symposium and the Laws and all the rest, other dialogues. He's constantly presenting this question to us. Socrates set forth the question best. He set forth the goal best, the aim best, according to Thoreau. That is, from Thoreau's point of view, it was in Plato and Socrates, that the Socratic quest is defined, that the goal, that the aim is best set forth. But, he said, from his point of view, it was not in Platonic dialogues, but it was in Eastern wisdom that the method was contained. The method was that of the Buddha. And uh, from Thoreau's perception, and rarely did we have this in the United States, that is, an individual who would be able to put Buddhism and Platonism on each and be able to converse easily in both and to gain insights from both. And this is why the Indian students ask me, have you read Thoreau? Because they feel in him a kindred spirit, and they feel in him a kindred spirit because they know very well that he's read the Bhagavad Gita. And because he adores Buddha, and it's particularly the life of the Buddha that he is attracted to, because that life, and you've probably seen the life explained in Joseph Campbell's splendid works on Eastern mythology, especially the hero of a thousand faces, or perhaps in the, in the TV, the PBS series with um, Bill Moore and Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell describes it, analyzes the life of the Buddha extraordinarily well in terms of stages of development. And I think these stages of development apply extraordinarily well to, to Thoreau and to his life. And I feel that Thoreau felt, would have felt the same. And that is when we're looking at the life of the Buddha, according to Campbell, the first stage is that of separation. When the Buddha turns his back at age 18 on the affluence, the lifestyle, the possessiveness of his parents, of his father especially, was determined to keep him in the palace. Buddha, a Hindu at that point, confined to the palace, and then you probably know the story, he turns his back on that, manages to contrive an escape from the palace for a short period of time, goes out and finds that all that his father told him just isn't so. That is, that there's death and disease and old age out there. Well, Buddha comes back and then contrives a much longer escape, and for seven years he leaves and he's wandering in the wilderness during a period which Campbell calls illumination or discovery, or initiation. It's a period of time, and this is the important point, in which the journey is a physical one, in a sense, but more important than that from Thoreau's point of view, and this is what he was especially, especially fascinated with. It was a spiritual journey. It was an inward journey. It was introspective. And that's why it seems to me it is a precise parallel to the kind of journey that Thoreau took. Thoreau, of course, traveled all over the East, but when he journeyed as he did in Walden Pond to a point in time, it was a point in time within him. It was a spiritual journey. And that's what I think fascinates people. As Campbell says so well, dozens of cultures around the world have set forth the same kind of paradigm for their heroes. That is separation, when one says an emphatic no, in a non-conformist spirit to one's prevailing culture, and then initiation or illumination, which is always a journey of introspection, and then as Campbell says, again, precisely what happened to Thoreau, the last part of the journey is the return, when one re-enters society and the wisdom that one manages to convey if one has discovered anything. And uh, as Thoreau liked to say, the highest wisdom of all is that wisdom gleaned from not the Platonic texts, but from the Hindu texts.
Recall the Hindu texts, uh, the Upanishads, especially the Chandogya Upanishads, says that the truly enlightened man is he who sees all being in himself and himself in all being. When Thoreau read that line, it lit him up because he realized as a naturalist, as a person who identified with all being in a way that very few American writers or philosophers at this time were able to do, as this individual merging, as he says, with the waters of Walden Pond, as he did that, he felt that he was fulfilling the Hindu dictum. That was the highest level of enlightenment. At that point, Thoreau said, he resolved to become a vegetarian. The whole concept of Thoreau's then entering into a world of being, a world of being that would take him through this spiritual journey and on back into society to share with us the truth that he had discovered. This is a concept so sacred in terms of Platonic and Socratic dialogues, in terms of Buddhist religion and uh, Hindu philosophy, that the very fact that Thoreau managed to absorb it and then to practice it as he did is phenomenal. We look to Thoreau with pride, as we can, unfortunately, during the 19th and 20th centuries, very few Americans, because here we see a person who is truly universal in spirit, who, although he never journeyed outside the United States, and Europe and other countries, as Emerson and others would do, he managed through his internal journeys to travel to India and to China and to experience the wisdom of those countries and to put it into practice. That, then, is what we want to say about Thoreau, about the journey, about his significance. And however some individuals categorize Thoreau as a weirdo or a kook or a nonconformist who has gone off the deep end and did want to biz, as some of my students like to say in their term papers, this guy couldn't possibly be more irrelevant to the 20th century. We reply to that that Thoreau managed to attain what very few individuals have done in America or elsewhere, and that is to enter into a spirit of universality, to break out of parochialism, to manage, as he took his journeys, to appeal to those Indians in Madras and Delhi and Calcutta, as well as to the people in Concord or at sometimes Barnard College. The point is this. The journey is all important. The journey is important with Gandhi, the journey is important with Martin Luther King, with Malcolm X, who records the journey in his autobiography as well as any American does. The journey is the thing. That is, from Thoreau's point of view, key. So we have with Socrates, what course of life is best? What is the best course of life? To know thyself. The unexamined life is not worth living. Thoreau takes this aim, this goal, as his own and applies it to himself and applies it as he moves into Walden Pond. Now, of course, some of the, the comments that he makes in Walden are extreme. And uh, the comments that he makes further in the essay on civil disobedience that I want to turn to after Walden are also extreme. Unlike Locke, Thoreau is emphatically an extremist. And he's a person who uh, takes the extreme journeys of life seriously. And so in Walden, when he says, and this is, these are the lines, if you haven't seen them already, they're inscribed in stone near the site of that hut on the edge of Walden Pond, among the best lines, it seems to me, that Thoreau ever penned in the uh, conclusion of Walden, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not when I came to die discover that I had not lived. That's a beautiful line. And when I talk about Thoreau in my theory ca classes at Barnard College, I always pause in that line. And I say, regardless of what LSAT exam or law, corporate law firm you're dying to get into, whatever business degree you must take, whatever 
graduate school, you must enter. This is what you must avoid at all costs. Don't get to the end of your life and discover that you have not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life, living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. Because our life is frittered away by detail, Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Most of the luxuries, many of the so-called comforts of life are not only not indispensable, but positive hindrances to the true liberation of mankind. The luxuriously rich are not simply kept comfortably warm, but unnaturally hot. Wonderful occasion for that line. They are cooked, a la mode, of course. It is desirable that a man be clad so simply that he can lay his hands on all he wears in the dark. I say, beware of all enterprises that require new clothes. Because a man is rich in proportion to the number of things that he can let alone. Superfluous wealth can buy superfluities only. Money cannot purchase one necessary of the soul. Well, that's Walden, and uh, we need we need literary figures to to write like that again. We need lines like that desperately. Maybe not with the same philosophy, but with the style, with the elegance, with the ability to write in English. The literate, the articulate. It just seems to me are getting fewer and fewer among us. And maybe it's because they don't spend long periods of time sequestered in a hut without electricity or any of the other conveniences. At any rate, Thoreau's masterpiece is Walden, as we know. And uh, it's a literary masterpiece. We study it because of the journey. We go to it because of the personal quest that's related there. But it's not his political work. His political work is the work that I want to turn to now, and that's his essay on civil disobedience. If Walden sets forth then his idea of separation, of saying no in a physical and spiritual <coughs> sense, I'll not have any of these superfluities. I'll not have this way of life. I'll turn to my own inner quest then the essay on civil disobedience sets forth his emphatic no in another sense, and that is no to the political and economic systems of his country. You know, it's been written often and observed repeatedly that there is a striking consensus among American writers, maybe even an alarming consensus, among certain ideas that have been intellectuals, even strongly critical intellectuals taken for granted. The consensus from the time of the founding fathers seems to be about the, over the, the sacred nature of our nation state, that is American nationalism, the representative, the institutions of representative democracy that we hold so dear, and of course the idea and the practice of capitalism. Thoreau's no, emphatic no, extends in a resounding way, not just to one of these, but to all of them. He says emphatically no to all of the political and economic institutions of the United States. He insists then in the most categorical and sweeping way to be a total outsider, whereas the reformist lock that we looked at earlier is very much of an insider within his own culture. We can look, it seems to me, and search for vain for a person who is more of an outsider in American culture than Thoreau. He puts himself so far outside the consensus of values, political and economic values, that so many people from Jefferson on thought were sacred. Thoreau is so iconoclastic, we sometimes think that he is out above all to smash idols. But there is a positive side, as we'll argue, to his thought. The essay on civil disobedience, then, 
It begins with a story that you've probably heard, so I'll again tell it as briefly as I can. But it's a story that involves Thoreau living at Walden Pond one morning, July 23rd, 1846. Uh, he notices that his shoe he's repairing, and so he has to walk in those 27 minutes. I'm sure he made it much faster than we do when we go out to Concord and uh, look up the cobbler and get his shoe repaired. Well, he walks into town. As he's going through the town square, he runs into Sam Staples, an old friend of his. Sam Staples, not only Thoreau's friend, but he's also the town tax collector, the sheriff, jailer, variety of functions. So he runs into Sam Staples, and Sam says, uh, uh, Henry, uh, I noticed the other day I was going through my tax books, and you haven't paid your poll tax recently. And Henry says, I haven't paid it in seven years, Sam. Uh, and Sam says, well, you know, if you're hard up, Henry, I'll pay it for you. Don't, uh, don't worry about that. And Henry says, no, Sam, you don't get the point. I'm not paying it because I have problems with the principle of paying this tax. And uh, Sam says, well, Henry, I don't know about that, but uh, I'm going to have to lock you up if you don't pay the tax. Well, the problems that Henry had with the principle were that he rejected the whole idea of being taxed to serve two institutions. The first institution, which he had been complaining about as an abolitionist in Concord for several years, was the institution of slavery. The other institution was the institution of war. And that is, the United States, remember, in 1846 and fought until 1848, it got into another obnoxious war, and that is the war with Mexico. And Thoreau thought, on principle, he should not pay taxes to support either the institution of slavery or the war in Mexico. And so he told Sam Staples then, look, Sam, uh, if you have to lock me up, that's it's the way it's got to be. And Sam says, look, I'm your friend. I'm a friend of the family. I don't want to put you in jail. But what's my alternative? And then Henry sort of clinched it by saying, well, Sam, you've got one alternative. Just resign your job. <laughs> and uh, Sam didn't take well to that. But it was the same line that Gandhi in 1921 gave to a British judge who tried him in Ahmedabad and convicted him of civil disobedience. Gandhi, who had read Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience so well, and the judge who expressed such great admiration for Gandhi at that point, and Gandhi responded, you know, you do have an alternative judge. You can resign your job. Well, that idea of non-cooperating with the system, of saying no to the prevailing culture, was not one that Sam Staples would follow, but Thoreau, of course, follows it with a vengeance he had been all this time dedicated to precisely that idea. And in the essay on civil disobedience, which he delivered as an address at the town forum in Concord, 18 months after his one night in prison, spent only one night because as far as we know, one of his aunts bailed him out, but that hasn't been determined for sure. We don't know who actually paid the fine to get him out, a uh, closely guarded family secret. At any rate, after only one night, Thoreau gets his ideas together and then gradually ruminates on them as he's living at Walden and then gives uh, the essay on civil disobedience as an address, as I said, 18 months later on January 26th, 1848. The time we should note, January 26th, 1848, because perhaps by coincidence, perhaps not, it's exactly the same time to the day, to the month that Karl Marx is publishing the Communist Manifesto in exile in London. And the kind of parallels that we we'll want to draw between Marx's version of resistance and Thoreau's version of resistance are, I think, really instructive. Thoreau begins the essay on civil disobedience with these lines. I heartily accept the motto, that government is best which governs least. And I should like to see it acted up to more rapidly and systematically. Well, at that point, Locke and John Stuart Mill, too, would be with Thoreau. That is, they would agree that government is best which governs least. This was the 19th century liberal position. But Thoreau did not stop there. Carried out, it finally amounts to this, which also I believe that government is best which governs not at all. And uh, that's where Locke and Mill and the other British liberals leave Thoreau cold because that's 
anarchy. From Thoreau's point of view, this is the ultimate ideal. And when men are prepared for it, and we want to note that he does say that, he insists that he is not an anarchist because he is not for the immediate abolition of government. But when men are prepared for it, that will be the kind of government that they will have. In other words, no government. Government is at best but an expedient. Remember Locke said that. But most governments are usually, and all governments, are sometimes inexpedient. Locke wouldn't have said that. So we have Thoreau, in the end, departing from the liberal position, moving into a radical position. And the radical position is reinforced when he says things like, witness the present Mexican war, the work of comparatively a few individuals using the standard government as their tool. This American government is each instant losing some of its integrity, its honesty. The government does not keep the country free. The American people keep the country free. And it would have, they would have done more if the government had not got in their way. A government in which the majority rule, in all cases, cannot be based ever on justice. Can there not be a government in which majorities do not virtually decide right and wrong, but free conscience? In which majorities decide only those questions to which the rule of expediency is applicable? Must the citizen ever for a moment or in the least degree resign his freedom of conscience always to the legislator? Why has every man a free conscience then? I think that we should be men first and subjects afterward. It's not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law so much as for the rights. The only obligation which I have a right to assume is to do at any time what I think right. Law never made men a whit more just, and by means of their respect for it, even the well-disposed are daily made the agents of injustice. Now notice how when Thoreau is criticizing government and uh, the institutions of law and democracy. He resists the idea emphatically of majority rule. He rejects the concept of representative democracy. Other Americans hadn't done this. Jefferson had held other American political theorists. He, Jefferson held the idea of representative democracy sacred. From Jefferson's point of view, uh, the op any opposition to democracy, to representative democracy, was anathema. Thoreau takes on, then, this first key institution of American politics, that is the state, nationalism, representative democracy, and uh, treats it with, from his point of view, the criticism that it deserves. Now, the Indictment here, as you've seen, as you've heard, is not just of representative democracy in the abstract. Law never made men a whit more just. One can imagine what Locke would say about that. To criticize the institution of law, to argue that law had to be treated critically and sometimes disobeyed. This is the first time that an American political theorist, at least, had urged this that is, civil disobedience. And we'll get into this further when he becomes more and more explicit. Note how the criticism is relentless. It continues, for example, to the institution of voting. All voting, Thoreau says, is a sort of gaming, like playing checkers or backgammon, with a slight moral tinge to it, a playing with right and wrong, with moral questions, and betting naturally accompanies it. The character of the voters is never staked. I cast my vote per chance, as I think right, but I am not vitally concerned that that right should prevail. I don't think it through. I'm willing to leave it to the majority. Its obligation, therefore, never exceeds that of expediency. There is no thought involved in the process. Even voting for the right is not thinking about it or doing anything for it. It's only expressing to men feebly your desire that it should prevail. 
A wise man will not leave the right to the mercy of chance, nor wish it to prevail through the power of the majority, because there is little virtue in the action of masses of men. Some have called Thoreau an elitist because of this. He certainly is not a Democrat. That is, he's arguing now a radical position, an extreme position against democracy. And notice how the position goes. It relates to what we were saying about Locke. Locke was confident, remember, in majority rule. The majority was, as we saw, severely restricted, but nevertheless, he was confident in that. And then when we dealt with the other problem, which was raised in the form of a question, and that is, may there be tyranny of the majority, it's precisely that point that Thoreau takes up. And that's his key difference with Locke. That is, he moves to one extreme in terms of his indictment of representative democracy in precisely this sense. He says that to guarantee through democracy freedom, that's a false guarantee. Because there may be, may be no freedom when the majority oppresses the single individual. No part of our political system is spared in this indictment. Thoreau, in a way that outraged Emerson, took on the American Constitution itself, asking Emerson, is it not true that this Constitution sanctions slavery? And therefore, is it not true that this Constitution must be resisted? And so he is at war. He's at war with the state, as he says. And in the, uh, in the essay on civil disobedience, he says, I wish to refuse allegiance to the state to withdraw and stand aloof from it effectually. I don't care to trace the course of my dollar, if I could, till it buys a man or a musket to shoot one with. The dollar is innocent, but I'm concerned to trace the effects of my allegiance. In fact, then, I quietly declare war with the state. Now, that reference to dollar here suggests his attack on commerce. And if he is an outsider in terms of his criticism of nationalism, of the state, American government, of representative democracy, including the institutions of law and voting, if he's a critic in all of those respects and a profound outsider in all of those ways, then I think that he's even further an outsider in his critique of capitalism, that is, of the economic institutions of our society, that is, of the way in which we measure, often, happiness in terms of the accumulation of things. And uh, he continues this critique of capitalism throughout the essay, but to read only a couple of parts. Practically speaking, the opponents to a reform in Massachusetts, that is, a reform to oppose slavery and the war with Mexico, are not a thousand are not a hundred thousand politicians in the South, but a hundred thousand merchants and farmers here who are more interested in commerce and agriculture and making money than they are in freedom and humanity. And they are not prepared to do justice to the slave and to Mexico, cost what it may. I quarrel then, not with far off foes in the South, but with those of my neighbors who here, near at home, cooperate with and do the bidding of those far away and without whom the latter would be harmless. This didn't make him terribly popular at this time among the people of Concord. And uh, when we journey around Concord and find out the local lore about Thoreau's neighbors, uh, many of them highly critical of Thoreau because he constantly took them to task. And he reminds us so much of Socrates who had this nasty habit of going up to a reputable citizen of the town, buttonholing him and saying, you know, what about truth? What about justice? Let's stop for a minute. Let's, we, I know you have an important business engagement, but, but let's pause for just a moment and let's discuss the nature of the good. Well, that made Socrates so unpopular, he took the hemlock. But remember, he was 70 years old at the time. Thoreau was only 44 when he died of TB. We have then uh, maybe conquered, released, in a way, as a result of that terrible illness, uh, from the guilt uh, that Thoreau constantly visited on it. Now, get this line, which reminds me so much of, in a sense, of what Thoreau was, what uh, Marx was writing at this exact same time in the essay on uh, civil disobedience, no, in his Communist Manifesto. 
Thoreau says this in his indictment of our economic institutions. The rich man is always sold to the institution which makes him rich. Absolutely speaking, the more money, the less virtue. For money comes between a man and his objects and obtains them for him. And it was certainly no great virtue to obtain it. It puts to rest many ethical questions which he would otherwise be taxed to answer. While the only new question which it puts to him is the hard but superfluous one of how to spend his money. Thus his moral ground is taken from under his feet. The opportunities of living are diminished in proportion as what are called the means are increased. Now Thoreau didn't read Marx, but and Marx certainly didn't read Thoreau, but the the similarities here are sometimes striking. That is, Marx too may well have written, the rich man is always sold to the institution which makes him rich. That was his critique of the bourgeoisie. But he wouldn't have said, absolutely speaking, the more money, the less virtue. Because Marx felt that he was a social scientist, not into a moral indictment of humanity. And he never used the term virtue and the need to attend to one's virtue. So notice this clear distinction between Thoreau, as well as the parallel that is both Marx and Thoreau coming down hard, very hard, on the uh, capitalist class. But Marx arguing that the capitalist class is not mainly greedy and avaricious. It's rather caught up in this dialectic of history, a dialectic of history that will carry it to its own self-destruction and the proletariat will overthrow it. That was the main theme of the Communist Manifesto. From Thoreau's point of view, that wasn't his line at all. And it's significant what his line is. His line is intensely individualistic. That is, never does Thoreau talk about class and collective. From Thoreau's point of view, Class analysis doesn't have much meaning. It's the question of whether or not the individual is going to assume the responsibility to not pay his particular tax and to resist slavery or the war in Mexico. Thoreau never once talks about the proletariat, never discusses the bourgeoisie. These are terms, Marxist terms, that are European. Thoreau talks as a Yankee individualist about the rich man, his moral ground being taken from beneath him. Thoreau talks about, then, the single individual's protest against an unjust political system, an unfair economy. And when he does that, when he thinks of the individual and blames always the self and not the system, he sets forth a doctrine of civil disobedience, of resistance, uh, with which we're familiar. I know this well, he says, that if 1,000, if 100, if 10 men whom I could name, if 10 honest men only, I, if one honest man in this state of Massachusetts, ceasing to hold slaves, were actually to withdraw from this co-partnership with his state and be locked up in the county jail, therefore, it would be the abolition of freedom, uh, abolition of slavery in America and the dawn of freedom. If a 1,000 men were not to pay their tax bills this year, that would not be a violent and bloody measure. It would be a violent and bloody measure to pay them it, because it enables the state to commit violence and shed innocent blood. This is, in fact, the definition of a peaceable revolution. This is, in fact, then, what the tax gatherer or any other public officer asked me as one is done, what shall I do? My answer is, if you really wish to do anything, resign your office. When the subject has refused allegiance, the officer has resigned his office, then the revolution is accomplished. That is what we call the doctrine of nonviolent non-cooperation, a doctrine that has swept parts of the world in this century. In the conclusion of Walden, Thoreau recapitulates, summarizes, tells us the end of the journey for a time and the story. He says, I left the woods for as good a reason as I went there. 
Perhaps it seemed to me that I had several more lives to live. Remarkable line, it seems to me. It seemed to me that I had several more lives to live and could not spare any more time for that one. It's remarkable how easily and insensibly we fall into a particular route that enslaves us and makes a beaten track for us. I had not lived there a week before my feet wore a path from my door to the pond side, and so my freedom was diminished. I learned this, though, by my, from my experiment, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a freedom unexpected in common hours. If you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now put the foundations under them. Sixty years later, a young Indian lawyer in Johannesburg picked up this document that had been at times ridiculed by Americans. And that young Indian lawyer, 37 years old, read those words. And he says in his autobiography, they moved him as no other words did. The universality of ideas. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi picks up the essay on civil disobedience. And first, as a lawyer in Johannesburg and South Africa, representing the grievances of the South African Indians there, all 66,000 of them, defies the government under the inspiration of Thoreau and begins a civil disobedience campaign that until he left South Africa in 1914 was astonishingly successful, achieving all of the goals that it set forth through nonviolent non-cooperation. And those who despair over South Africa should look back at that period from 1906 to 1919 and see what nonviolence re nonviolent resistance can do. Gandhi took that message from South Africa in 1914-15 to India and brought it to 400 million Indians suffering from the colonization of Britain in India. He had read Locke, but now when he reads Thoreau, there is an element there of radicalism and extremism that he needs and he brings it to the Indian Revolution and he transforms that subcontinent and he proves to us once and for all that if there is an individual, an American, relevant to this age, it's Henry David Thoreau. 